I'd like you to think for a moment about how you'd like to be remembered once you're gone. Do you want to be remembered for the type of car you drive, the job you have, your bank balance? Or do you want to be remembered for the type of person you are, someone who likes to travel or cook or garden? These interests define us in part as individuals, and they define us in a way that is unique to our species. A lizard can't think of itself as a cook or a traveler simply because a lizard can't think about itself. It lacks the brain architecture necessary to do so, the cortex, the tissue that's largest in human beings and allows us to think abstractly about the world and our place in it. It's really quite amazing that we have this simulator function that allows us to dream of places we might go, of recipes we might cook. These are the gifts of the mind, but what about the brain? The brain is a three pound hunk of tissue. It's a complex biological system that's still poorly understood by the scientific community. The mind, on the other hand, is not just a matter of biology. It's the human experience of having thoughts, feelings, ideas. The mind is something all of us can understand better because it's something all of us experience. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, and today I'll talk to you about how my brain research has informed my understanding of the mind. And I'll apply my research on decision making to how you can make better decisions in everyday life. So one thing we've learned about the brain is that it's not a series of separate little modules, each doing their own thing. A vacation planning area here and a recipe planning area here. In fact, this approach to studying the brain was called phrenology, and this was a pseudoscience invented about 200 years ago. Phrenologists thought that by measuring the contours of the skull that they could identify traits like criminality. We've come a long way since then. Thanks to modern technological innovation, we appreciate that the brain is an interacting network of billions of neurons and dozens of regions. It's like a complex symphony orchestra piece, and you don't understand what an orchestra is doing just by asking the first violinist to play their part. So if we're going to study the brain as a complex system, we need more complex thinking and methods. We need networks. Now, networks have been studied for literally hundreds of years. The networks that I'm interested in in the brain are this lizard brain limbic system network, which is involved in basic emotion, fight or flight. And I call it the lizard brain because we actually have these areas in common with animals like lizards. We also have this unique human architecture, the cortex, which allows us to imagine these places we might want to travel, recipes we might want to try, and E equals MC squared. As I mentioned, networks have been around for a long time. So 300 years ago, the mathematician Leonard Euler was looking to identify the most optimal path through a complex bridge system in the city now known as Kaliningrad. In doing so, he uncovered a set of rules that would influence the next 300 years of network science. These rules about what's connected to what, path lengths, can now be applied to the study of brain anatomy as well as function. A example of the application of graph theory that you might already be familiar with is the pop culture phenomenon, six degrees of Kevin Bacon. <laughs> Graph theory to study the brain uses information about the timing in one brain area and tries to use it to predict subsequent activity in other brain areas. And to understand how these timing dynamics can teach us about brain relationships, I have an example from something you're probably already familiar with, which is Facebook. So if you imagine you have a Facebook profile with your picture but not your real name because you're trying to stay under the radar, despite these precautions, you wake up one day and you see a friend request from your evil ex-boyfriend, Dr. Evil. So the question is, how did he find you? Well, it turns out that earlier in the day, your Facebook friend, Julia Roberts, had posted a status update about her lovely teeth, which you then liked. Dr. Evil saw that you liked this status, recognized your picture, and sent you a friend request. So just to review, in the morning, Julia Roberts updated her status. You liked her status. And then later in the day, Dr. Evil saw that you liked the status, sent you the friend request. This is important because timing tells us something about causes and effects. A wet sidewalk doesn't cause rain. Rain causes a wet sidewalk. We can apply these principles to the study of the dynamics in brain networks. 
Now, if we're going to study the brain as a complex network, we need to give it something complex to do. So many studies have used simple stimuli, like a dollar today versus two dollars tomorrow, or choices amongst different types of food, to characterize how the brain makes decisions. But it struck me that many of our everyday decisions are not about food or money. You might lay in bed in the morning wondering, should you hit the snooze button and enjoy your comfy bed, or should you get up and go to the gym? I was very interested in understanding how these types of everyday decisions could be used to understand brain network dynamics. And this discrepancy between the real world and what we study in the lab is what's motivated my research in large part. Another reason preferences are interesting is that they're multidimensional. And what I mean by that is money can be described as having one dimension, which is value. Food can be described as having two, taste and health. But if you're trying to plan where to go on vacation, there's almost innumerable dimensions that you could use to decide. Cost, how far it is, what the cuisine's like, and so forth and so on. Not only that, but every person in this room could make their decision very differently. Whereas, if I asked you to rank these monetary amounts in order, you'd probably all do so the same way. But if I asked you to rank your preferences for this list of countries, you'd probably rank them all differently. So studying preferences also allows us to study people as individuals. In the last three years, I've had the opportunity to study the preferences and decision-making of over 100 people. And I also had the chance to put 20 more people inside the brain scanner here at the Rutgers University Brain Imaging Center. My interest is not just what people's preferences are, but how they make decisions about these preferences. We've known for a long time that we don't make decisions like computers that only care about rationality and maximizing payout. So today, I'll focus on decision-making biases and how my research has informed our understanding of how these biases work, and also how we can apply what we know about how the brain supports decision-making in order to make better decisions. So the first bias I'll talk about is called the framing effect. And the way this works is pretty simple. The way a question or a scenario is framed affects the way you make decisions. So for example, if your doctor tells you that you have a 70% chance of being cured of a disease, you'll respond differently to that information than if you're told you have a 30% chance of not being cured. When the emphasis is placed on loss, the not being cured part, it leads to this sort of gut emotional reaction called loss aversion. When people become loss averse, they then become motivated to take riskier decisions in order to avoid that loss entirely. So this could be something like pursuing an experimental medical treatment. I'm interested in framing in particular because it seems that at the heart of it is this lizard brain type response to loss. And my thinking was that the interactions between the lizard brain and the cortex might underlie how people respond to different decision frames. So in order to study this, I had participants in my studies choose from different sets of stimuli, and they got to choose their favorite category. So it could be something like travel or cultural activities. And to show you how this works, I'm gonna try a live experiment and collect some data from you. So I need your help. So what I'm gonna do is there's gonna be a question at the top of the screen and two answer options. I'll read the whole thing. And once I'm done reading it, I want you to shout out your answer to the question as quickly as you're able to. Ready? Which do you like more, museums or concerts? Concerts. All right. Which do you like more, zoos or art galleries? <laughs> Which do you like less, the library or the park? OK, you might have noticed a little pause on that last one. That's because which do you like less is a negative frame whereas which do you like more is a positive frame. The idea is that when you have to give something up, potentially, which do you like less, which do you reject, it can take longer to make those decisions. And you experienced this just now, and so did the participants in my study who had significantly longer reaction time for negative frames compared to positive. It's not just reaction time that's affected by frame. You might have noticed it also felt a little bit harder to make that decision, so I was interested in what about people's preference behavior actually changes because of framing. So what you're seeing here is a ranking and a graph of one participant's preferences. The ranking is the way they assign value to each of these options in order, 
And the graph treats each of these choices as a physical system. So what that means is if you chose novel once and newspaper twice, they'd be closer together, whereas if you chose novel once and newspaper 10 times, they'll be further apart. What we end up with is a graph where the preferred options are in the red square in the middle, and the least preferred options are on the edges of the graph in pink. And then the middle options are in blue and green in the middle of the graph and the ranking. So this is during positive framing, which do you like more? I was interested in how this changes when they're asked which they like less. So here are the two graphs side by side. And you can see that while the top options stay in the middle and the least preferred stay on the edges, these middle options, the blue and green, shift around quite a bit, both in the graph and in the preference ranking. So what this means is there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is that you are unlikely to be persuaded by framing differences when we're talking about your favorite things or things you strongly dislike. But all those middle options, the things you feel slightly positive, neutral, or slightly negative about, that's where you can be more vulnerable to a framing type effect. So what happens when people make these types of choices in a brain scanner? What you're seeing here is the activation for each of these conditions. Blue is the positive framing and red is negative framing. And the first thing you might notice is that there's no overlap between these conditions. There's no purple. This suggests that the brain processes these types of choices very differently. Additionally, the red pattern of activation for negative framing involves activity in areas involved in evaluating negative outcomes, like the insula, and also self-referential processing in the prefrontal cortex. These maps tell us about the activation in the brain, but they don't tell us how these areas are communicating. So it's kind of like saying there's a violinist and a percussion section and a wind section, but it doesn't tell you how they go back and forth, what piece they're playing. In order to study this, I used a method that measures the connectivity or communication between these regions so that I could look at interactions between the lizard brain and the cortex. This method is based on the timing principles that I talked about earlier, the wet sidewalk being caused by rain. So what this looks like is this set of graphs where in yellow we have our cortical areas and in green we have our lizard brain areas. Um, and I know it's a little small, um, but the key distinction is that during negative framing, the coupling or communication between the cortex and the lizard brain is stronger than during positive framing, shown here by the thicker arrows. So my predictions were substantiated that it's this interaction between cortex and emotional lizard brain that underlie your response to the negative frame. So what does this have to do with the mind versus brain distinction? It's clear that the brain is capable of amazing complexity, but we don't always put this into practice every day. So one way to think about framing in everyday life is scenarios where you want the dialogue to not be dominated by the lizard brain. So imagine you're planning where to go for dinner with some friends, and you have a friend who really likes this one taco place, but you're a little tired of tacos and you'd really rather try the new burger place. Instead of saying to your friend, oh, I'm so tired of tacos, which is something I would never say, by the way, um, for many reasons, um, instead of emphasizing that you don't want tacos, you might talk up how great this new burger place is. So by putting the emphasis on what they gain rather than what they lose, you shift the conversation away from activating the lizard brain. This is especially important whenever you're having an actual difficult conversation, whether it's with a coworker, a parent, a romantic partner. If you don't want the lizard brain to get activated and dominate, you probably want to put the emphasis on the positive frame, what they gain. So I said, the brain is very capable of enormous complexity, but despite this, very often our thinking falls back on these sort of oversimplified ways of looking at the world. So you might see people on Facebook or in real life blaming one figure or one individual for a whole series of calamities, even though the actual situations are far too complex to be caused just by one person. This type of good and bla bad, black and white, villain versus hero, false dichotomy thinking can be really an impediment to truly understanding what's going on in the world and also actually solving the problems rather than just complaining about them. So this leads me to the second bias that I'd like to talk about today called attitude polarization. The way this works is that the more information about an issue you're exposed to, 
This does not necessarily make you more informed, counter to what you might think. What actually happens is that you selectively attend or cherry pick the information that corresponds to what you already agree with, and so you just become more stubborn and dig in your heels about your views. So despite being wired for complexity, we have a bias to fall back on this oversimplified thinking that can impede our ability to understand the issues in the world today. But my thinking was, maybe the brain is like a muscle, and thinking in complexity might be like working out. So at first, it's hard and kind of painful, but once it becomes a habit, it's much more automatic and much more beneficial. So if thinking happens in networks, maybe our workout program can be injecting these networks into our thinking. So how do you do this? Well, one way is to flesh out your network so that instead of just a bad guy in conflict, you now account for other variables that might also be involved. There are many other examples where this approach of turning a dichotomy into a network is really important. Otherwise, we might think that yellow teeth cause cancer and ice cream sales cause crime. So what I hope you'll take away from this talk is that the brain is an amazing system that we're only just beginning to understand. Our brains are uniquely designed to handle complexity. So when you're faced with all the complicated choices in our brave new world, it can be hard to know what the best decision is. By being aware of decision-making biases like the framing effect or attitude polarization, we can train our minds using the muscle that is our brains. So let's be inspired by the networks in our thinking and start thinking in networks. It's something you can do right here in this room today. You probably already are. So today, let's change how we think about how we think. Thank you very much.